Uh, I'm going to invite Ace Stafford to come on up here at this time. And Ace is our candidate for community outreach pastor. And so I'm going to explain what that is in a little bit. But uh, I've known this man for six and a half years, something like that. And uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what's led to today, uh, our personnel committee and I, we met and we were trying to figure out what is the best way for us to make sure that we are staffing the church into the future. Our church right now, uh, on an average Sunday, is averaging somewhere around 1,220 to 1,250 people. And so our, our prayer is that in the personnel committee has given uh, Benji Ladd and I this task to figure out what will the staff look like uh, when we run 2,500 people one day and how will we plan into the future for that. Some of you are like, wow, I can't imagine that. Well, I'm trying to imagine it right now and I can't imagine it, but... Um, we need to plan for God to bring more lost people in here who get saved, and we better, better prepare proactively for that. So the personnel committee asked me to make a list of everything that we needed to do moving forward. And so I was listing out some things for the vision of, um, I want to start an intern program and a recreation ministry and get more tenacious in evangelism and, and laying out some things. And, and uh, so they decided... Uh, let's create a, a position. They came up with the title, the, the committee did, the community outreach pastor, I really like it. And so we formed a subcommittee to search for that person to, to form this new position. And so that subcommittee was comprised of uh, Linda Scarborough, who uh, is uh, the chairwoman of the committee. Linda's right here, you can raise your hand, Linda. Um, and then there uh, was Brian Hartzell on it, uh, Wes Kingry, uh, and then Benji Ladd and myself uh, were on that as well uh, in an ex officio manner. And so that's what led to today. Several candidates uh, were interviewed for it. And, uh, and the committee really feels led of the Lord that, uh, that A. Stafford is to be um, this candidate. And so the staff is unanimous behind calling him. The personnel committee is unanimously behind him. And, uh, and myself, I, uh, I remember I was Ace's professor uh, years ago when he was uh, at Tennessee Temple and uh, got to ordain him in the ministry. He was on my staff in Tennessee for uh, many years and did a great job there. And so I think it's good now for us just to hear his testimony and his heart for the Lord. So let's welcome A. Stafford to the church. All right, so how much time do I have? <laughs> I absolutely love the Lord Jesus, and there's so much that I can say. Uh, I want to make sure that I don't throw you guys a schedule off too much. So really, how much time do I have? Was that six minutes? All right, cool. I'll, I'll try to condense it. <clears throat> I'll try to condense it. Good morning, church family at Brushy Creek Taylors. Uh, as Pastor Jeremy said, uh, my name is A. Stafford. My real name is Corey. Uh, Ace is a nickname, and we'll, we'll get to that shortly. I was born in a small city uh, called Sanford. It's right in between Orlando and Daytona Beach. And uh, my mother and father were both married at the time. Uh, I say at the time because a little after, uh, they split up because my father was an abusive alcoholic. Uh, not only that, uh, he was very promiscuous. And the time came to where my mother just couldn't take it anymore. So the two of them separated. <clears throat> the two of them separated, and my mother went on to uh, father, well, mother, me, uh, my brother, uh, Blaine, my sister, Lawanda, and uh, my sister, Samanda. Well, uh, when I was about two years old, she had finally met someone new. Now, my life was already drastically flipped upside down. My father wasn't around. I just had my mom. Uh, on Saturday nights, we would have family movie nights. And I mean, this was huge to me. It really was. I still remember it like it was yesterday. I think I was about four years old at the time. It was August of 1995. It was when that movie Mortal Kombat came out. You guys familiar with that movie? It had just came out. And I mean, uh, they were releasing it in Blockbuster and such. So we go to Blockbuster. How many of you remember Blockbuster? <laughs> Yeah, see that? That's just a testament right there. Uh, we go to Blockbuster, and we get movies for this family movie night. Well, after my mother remarried, 
uh, there was a gentleman uh, named Warren. He was my stepfather. After she remarried, he had finally moved in. And we went to go pick up this movie, Mortal Kombat. I was super excited. I absolutely love karate and action and stuff like that. Well, uh, I still remember like yesterday, uh, he was sitting on the couch and he told my mother to send me and my sister to bed. And I thought to myself, first of all, this stranger comes into my house and he tells my mom to send me to bed. Who does this guy think he is? And my mother, being a loving wife, listened to him. I was so young, I couldn't understand this. I flipped out. I was thinking to myself, my mother is the only one I have and she's turned her back on me for this man. I don't even know who he is. My mom is here, she can tell you. I still remember that night in my bed, screaming, just really acting out, but it was really because my heart was broken. At that point, I felt as though I couldn't trust anyone. As life goes on, my sister Samanda, she was just phenomenal in school. I mean, she would come home, she would have the good colors, the happy faces, the A's and B's. Me, on the other hand, I got kicked out of three elementary schools. I just couldn't figure it out. And I thought to myself, there's no way that I could ever live up to the standard that she has set. So I tried to get my mother's attention by doing the wrong thing, which caused a lot of problems for me. Well, on one of my sister's birthdays, my father had bought her a bike. And at this time, we lived in a city called The Land. It was maybe 30 minutes outside of Sanford. We all get into the car, and we're heading to my father's house to pick this bike up for my sister. I still remember stopping at the gas station and going inside. It was a 7-Eleven. I picked up this toy, and it was a, a, fire, fire, a fire truck and two firemen. Ironically, we were going to need their services shortly. As we were driving into Sanford, it was storming, raining really bad. The roads were slick. My mother had dropped the credit card and she tried to reach down to pick it up. The truck had occurred and it flipped six times. I didn't have on my seatbelt, nor did my sister Samanda. I went out of the windshield first and I got this scar on my forehead and I landed in the field. I broke my left arm, my left leg. My sister Samanda, which was the golden child, she went chest first into a tree. They tried to helivac her out, but when she got to the hospital, she didn't make it. My mother was trapped in the truck. It crushed both of her legs. She still has the scars to show for it today. I remember waking up in the hospital, wondering what was going on. I couldn't open my eyes because there was so much blood that had run down and hardened in them. I went to reach out with my left hand and smack myself with the cast and thought, what is going on? What is this on my arm? When I finally scratched the blood away, I opened my eyes and I look around the hospital room, not realizing that my life was going to change drastically. You see, my older sister, Wanda, and brother, uh, Blaine, both had dropped out of school in the eighth grade. My sister, Samanda, was on track to be just the the family all-star, the first one to ever make it. Now she was gone. I still remember being by, beside my mother as she was in her bed, unable to walk, still broken over the fact she had just lost one of her children. And she grabbed me tightly and she said, you're the last one, you're the last hope. In my mind, I thought, wow, now the honor has been bestowed upon me now I can try to do everything I can to make my mother proud. Started doing better in school, got into sports. My uh, career started to take off. By the time I was 12 years old, I was known in the area of Central Florida by all of the major colleges within the state. But see, I still had a sin nature. Before everyone else, I was this honor roll baseball player that was just incredible guy, bright future. But behind the scenes, I was doing some really terrible stuff. As I said, my father was really promiscuous. I had a brother that was two months younger than I. This is just how promiscuous he was. Me and this brother 
were introduced to one another by my father, and we became like this. We were closer than white on rice. I mean, we were inseparable. He and I used to get into all types of things together. Well, all the while, I'm trying to mask and, and hide everything that I was doing behind the scenes. My younger brother was right there by my side, and he saw everything that was going on. When I hit the sixth grade, me and a few friends and I decided that we wanted to start our own game. And we called ourselves the East Side Reapers. We began to sell drugs. We began to prostitute women. We began to get into all of these terrible things. And it was on a really small scale. When we hit high school, we had become so popular and so known. We decided, all right, it's time for us to expand. Let's go to a large gang meeting and see how they operate. And this is what my best friend, Tavel, brought to me. When he first said it, it's like, dude, you an idiot. You really think this is gonna work out? You think they're gonna let us come in and spy on their organization and just walk away scotch-free? I said, but you're my best friend. If you do it, I got your back. I still remember walking into that building and seeing this massive 6'6 six, six guy and thinking to myself, well, this is it. If we don't join, we're probably going to die. That night, we ended up joining one of uh, the most major gang organizations still in the world. Life began to get really crazy at that point. In Florida, it is extremely organized. You have meetings, you have planning, you have, you have to, to get money, and, and just all of this crazy stuff. And I mean, the crime just went through the roof. Well, as I said, my younger brother and I were really close, and he saw everything that was going on, and he was always with me. By the time I became a junior in high school, I had gotten involved in some really, really terrible things, and there were some really terrible people that knew who I was, and they knew who my brother was. One night in Sanford, he was out with a friend. I was in a city called Castleberry with a girlfriend, and I just had this terrible feeling. I don't really know how to describe it, but I had a terrible feeling. I told her that I had to go home early because something just felt so wrong. I leave, I get home, she calls, and I'm just like, I don't know what it is, but something just doesn't feel right. Midnight rolls around, my older sister Wanda calls me, and she's crying hysterically on the phone. And when I finally get her to calm down, I hear on the other line her, her voice say, Dominique's been stabbed. The very first emotion that I felt was anger. You see, because a few months before this took place, there was a gentleman by the name of Pedro Rivera that came and knocked on my door. And when he did, he invited me to church with him. And I thought to myself, if this guy really knew who I was, he would not be standing at my door right now. When he invited us to church, my mother can, can attest to this, uh, we decided to finally go one Sunday. And when we arrived, we pull up to this two-story house. And I'm like, what in the world? What's going on? Uh, we walk inside. And this gentleman literally set up a sanctuary in his garage. It's like, this is crazy. <laughs> This guy has no clue who I am. He's inviting me to his house. My mind was just blown. He begins to teach me the word of God. And I was just soaking it all in. And while soaking it all in, I would take it and share it with my brother. And I told him, listen, you need to leave this life alone. You need to get out of the streets. You need to focus on a better life. This is the life I chose. This life isn't for you. He was on a full ride scholarship to Duke University. So many emotions flew through my mind. You see, there were three guys that I had gotten to some really, really big trouble with. And while my brother was out with his friend, they saw him and they knew that he was my brother. And so they went after him. I finally arrived to the hospital later that night and the door is open. And I see a lot of the women in my family come pouring out of the hospital. At that moment, I knew it was over for my brother. He passed away that very night. 
I went crazy. I went looking for the guys. I went looking for the friend that he had. My mind was just caught up in all of the wrong things. I finally got home, and I went to my bedroom, and I fell on my knees, and I said, God, why did you allow this to happen? I was telling my brothers about, my brother about all of the things that Pastor Pedro was telling me about. Why did you allow this to happen to him? And I remember Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. It was only the Holy Spirit that brought that verse to my remembrance that night. And I realized, okay, God, I get it. I wasn't trusting you. I thought I had it all figured out. I was living the way that I wanted to live because I thought that I knew the way in. And my brother saw it, and he followed that. No matter what I said to him, he didn't do what I said. He did what I was doing. I said, Lord, if you would have me, please use my life to never lead another person down this path again. I didn't know what I was asking for, church. But I put my faith in Jesus that night. I repented of my sin. And I know you know exactly what I'm talking about. It was as if the anvil was picked up off of my back. I was truly liberated from everything that I had done. It was true freedom. I knew. I knew that Jesus was real. I knew that he loved me. And I knew at that moment he saved me. I was so excited, church. I began to take it to the guys that were in the gang with me. And I would pull them to the side and I would begin to share. Because all of that stuff that was being poured into me started coming back. And I would remember and I would just be so anxious to let the guys know. As time went on, three of the guys that were in the gang with me decided to walk away and give their life to Jesus as well. It was miraculous. It truly was. I came to a crossroad. <laughs> I said, God... I realize I can't continue to be a gang member and claim to be a Christian at the same time. Something has to give, but I'm terrified because if I try to get out, I know I'm going to be in trouble. And I remember opening my Bible and reading in Matthew chapter 10, this verse 28. It says, fear not those who can destroy the body, but fear him who can destroy the body and the soul eternally in hell. It was like, all right, God, I get it. <laughs> I get it. And I walked away that day and began to serve Jesus and Jesus alone. I, I committed to going to a Christian school because even though my, my baseball career was taken off, I could have I could have went anywhere that I wanted to. I could have entered the draft right out of high school, but I wanted to learn more about my faith because prior to that, I was really skeptical. Went to a Christian university and God started pouring his truth into me. I began to learn more about my faith. He began to send people into my life that would disciple me and teach me his ways. And I got the opportunity to serve him. And I still remember the very first summer that I got to serve him, uh, we were doing ministry. And there was over 714 teenagers that gave their life to Christ in one summer. I knew then that I wanted to serve God for the rest of my life. While in college, I met my beautiful wife, Shanetta. If you would, please stand up. She's, she's kind of shy. I met her. Uh, and the Lord truly blessed me. And uh, since then, he's been allowing me to share my story with people, uh, connect with people, in order to see their eternity uh, change forever. Now, I know many of you may be wondering, well, when you come here, you know, what is your vision? What do you want to see? I'm extremely passionate about evangelism because it's the one way that we can truly get the gospel out to others. I know sometimes we feel inadequate. Sometimes it seems intimidating. We may think that we don't know enough, but it's not about intellect. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the gospel. When we remember that we are in need of the gospel on a daily basis, we will be effective in sharing that gospel with others. Take a moment and think about it today. That time when Jesus Christ saved your life, when Jesus Christ lifted that weight off of your shoulder, 
allowed that joy that's restored in your heart, the moment that you were saved, to be the same joy that you want others to receive, the same gift you want others to have and experience. A few things that I love to do, do here through evangelism is attractional evangelism, having events that we can invite people to where individuals can share their testimony about how God stepped into their life and changed it for eternity and invite them to have their lives changed. Relational evangelism, simply getting to know those around us for the sake of sharing the gospel with them. Street evangelism. Last night, I got the opportunity to go downtown with Pastor Jeremiah, and as we were riding through, there were so many people there. I mean, so many. There was an evangelist that spoke one time, and he was in the presence of great people while he was overseas, and so many people would say, do you know who that person was? And he'd say, no, who was it? And say, that's a very prominent person in this culture. And he'll say, oh, they need Jesus too. <laughs> and that's the fact of life for every single individual, no matter what they look like, no matter what culture they come from, no matter what they dress like, no matter how they act. They need Jesus, too. 